today we have the pleasure of CEO Esther Munya, Dr. Lily Muldoon, as well as Stephanie Allily from Pihoa. They'll be discussing the recent COVID-19 guidelines, as well as some updates from CDC regarding community levels. So we'll start with CEO, then Stephanie, then Dr. Muldoon. After that, we'll open for questions. All right, CEO, whenever you're ready. Okay, hi, hi everyone. So um, as you all know, we are still reporting a significant amount of COVID cases, uh, but we are seeing a steady number of hospitalizations. We are extremely concerned with the number of deaths, and it is why we want to make sure that, uh, of course, in the hospitalizations, and we want to make sure that high-risk patients get up to date with the vaccines, meaning they have received their booster shots, and ensure that we get therapeutic treatments in a timely manner. And Dr. Modun will discuss the criteria for getting that treatment uh, later on. While we did have a short interruption to our usual testing capacity, we want to inform the community that CHEC continues to have adequate supply of vaccines, uh, boosters, and tests. Our inventory of treatments is also always monitored and is also readily available. All of these will prevent or lessen severe illnesses for many people if they become infected with the virus that causes COVID-19. Our ability to prevent or reduce severe illnesses makes it less critical to focus on stopping every case of COVID-19. As we had announced last month, we had shifted our strategy to minimizing the impact of COVID-19 COVID has on our health, our healthcare systems, and our community while still focusing our efforts on protecting those who are most at risk of severe illness. So as Gil mentioned, CDC's new COVID-19 community levels assess data related to proportion of hospital capacity devoted to caring for COVID-19 patients, the number of new patients with COVID-19 admitted to the hospital in the past week, and the number of new COVID-19 cases in the CNMI in the past week. So the virus will continue to circulate, obviously, in our communities, as we have reported that, you know, cases continue to, to be at a higher level. We must prevent COVID-19 over, from overwhelming our hospitals and our healthcare systems and protecting the high risk. So we will continue to provide outreach services for those that are especially at high risk for hospitalization. MCAS uh, provides a location for a test to treat meaning if you are symptomatic, we can test you right there and treat you also. The provider who determines the best therapeutic treatment can either provide the service at the MCATS or prescribe you the oral medications uh, you know, using our pharmacy, uh, which is really just across from the MCATS. There will be times, again, uh, we want to, you know, at this point, uh, um, Stephanie will be describing the level, the community level that we are in, and there will be times when, when we may shift. And so, again, we will just want to remind everyone that we want, if you've tested positive for COVID-19 or if you have symptoms of COVID-19, take steps to prevent spreading the virus to others, stay home for five days, stay away from others, and, of course, wear a mask for at least, up to, uh, at least 10 days after testing positive. And if you have symptoms of COVID-19, wear a mask and get tested to find out if you are infected. Extra precautions, again, we're, you know, we're talking about the high risk, maybe need, we want to make sure that there are extra precautions that you put in place for uh, making sure that we protect our friends, our neighbors, and our loved ones, especially with those increased risk of severe illnesses. And um, the best way, of course, to protect young children who are not eligible for vaccines is to ensure that people around them are also up to date on their vaccinations. And um, Travel testing, uh, we have uh, made the, because of the MCATs, and again, we want to make sure that we have the ability to test people and treat them. We want to make sure that the travel testing has uh, is is out of that uh, uh, operations, and we have moved that operations over to Kobler Center, uh, the Koblerville Com uh, Community Center, and um, and if you have any questions about that, I can I can answer also. Uh, we do have information also about the fourth shot. 
for especially for the high risk and is uh, the moderately to severely immunocompromised vaccines uh, vaccine recipients. We do have a form. We we have a fourth dose referral form. As the CDC guideline states, vaccine recipients are encouraged to speak with their healthcare provider about their medical condition or conditions and whether getting a fourth dose is appropriate for them. This form will be shared with the uh, all providers, uh, CHCC providers, as well as private providers, so that they can complete the document. Uh, there will be information on what you know, what uh, criteria or what what is the recommendation for for uh, if the if their patient actually meets the uh, eligibility for the fourth dose. So there, those are going to be provided to the providers, and once that form is completed, then they can bring that to a community. Uh, Either, either with the uh, outreach or with the mass vaccination site, which is located right now at the um, multipurpose center, as well as if you are going to the immunization clinic as well. So I'll turn it over to Gil, who will turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you. Yes, thank you, CEO. Now we'll have Stephanie Kern Allerly speak on the CDC community levels. Uh, thanks, CEO, and, and thanks, Gil. Uh, welcome, Medium Partners. Uh, always good to see you guys um, and allowing us this opportunity to share uh, news with you all uh, regarding new CDC uh, approaches. Um, so I just wanted to quickly share uh, the new COVID-19 community guidelines. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen here so that folks can see it. Apologies for the short delay here. Are folks able to see that all right? Yes, ma'am. Thanks so much, Gil. Uh, so the new community COVID-19 guidelines uh, has three different metrics involved with it. Uh, the new COVID cases per 100,000 people in the last seven days is this big uh, first indicator. Uh, we're looking for 200 or fewer um, for Okay, I think I'm back. Apologies, um, my internet has been going in and out and should it continue, I'll go ahead and move into the other conference room. Um, uh, the other two metrics, um, I'll just continue, are, are new COVID admissions per 100,000 population for a seven day total and then the percent of staff inpatient beds occupied by COVID-19 patients. There are a couple of indicators here. Uh, I won't go belabor the point here. Uh, this is available on the CDC website. So how are we doing in the CNMI? Um, so metric number one is the number of new COVID cases per 100,000 people in the past Okay, I think I'm back again. <laughs> Apologies, folks. Uh, I think I have a faulty uh, internet cord. Um, as you can see, here we are in the CNMI. We have a really high transmission rate currently, although that's been declining in recent weeks, which is a great, great news. Um, thanks to, uh, you know, folks getting their booster shots, et cetera. That 200 uh, line is down here. We haven't seen that since the end of November, but um, we are a jurisdiction that saw the Delta and Omicron variants simultaneously, which has you know, really spurred transmission for such a long period of time. And now with the numbers coming down, I'm hopeful that that will uh, trend will continue. Um, a second metric is our new COVID admissions per 100,000 population. This is our seven day total admissions. Um, so in the last a uh, couple of days, it's been the, our hospitalizations, our admissions have been uh, fairly stable. As you can see, um, this in December is our, our Delta surge and, and these hospitalizations over here are in our Omicron surge are, are about equal actually, um, which is uh, a testament to the high vaccination coverage, uh, our prevention of severe disease in the community, our focus on providing treatment for those individuals and our community be really being engaged to reduce transmission, but also to uh, protect those who are at most high risk of severe disease. Um, so you can see we're looking for 20 or 10, depending on how many cases we have in the community. This would be our low transmission rate at 10 new admissions per 100,000. And this would be our medium community level um, at 20. So we're almost at that 20 mark actually um, for medium, though we need our transmission, uh, current transmission rate to slow down a little bit to have fewer cases uh, ongoing in the community. And the third metric is the percent of staff in patient beds that are occupied by COVID-19 patients. And this is a seven day average. Um, so right now we're hovering around uh, 12 to about 10% and 10% is the level we're looking for, for uh, a medium or low uh, community level in the CNMI. So how are we doing currently? Our current COVID-19 community level in the CNMI uh, with data up to March 1st is high. Uh, again, 
uh, although our transmission, our two of our three are sort of uh, close to that uh, lower medium mark, we still have really high rates of COVID-19 here in the community in, uh, in Saipan. And, and we're also seeing cases in Tinian and Rota, which we didn't see with the Delta surge back in um, um, December. Uh, so until that uh, overall transmission number um, comes down a little bit further, uh, we'll still be in this high category. Um, and there are additional details on the CDC website on what does this mean? Uh, what does this mean for our community, et cetera? I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Um, okay, I think I figured it out. <laughs> Apologies, technology is still difficult for me. Uh, but with that, I uh, just wanted to kind of share our current status uh, regarding COVID. We still have a high transmission rate. Uh, we want to encourage folks. We've been seeing a, a reduction in testing over the past couple of weeks. Uh, folks haven't really been accessing the testing that's available uh, as often. Uh, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Uh, we know that this virus is asymptomatic primarily. We have a lot of folks who are asymptomatic who don't even know they have it. So I would encourage folks to access testing um, if they do have symptoms, if you have symptoms of COVID-19, right? We know those cough, fever, uh, shortness of breath, um, if you're having difficulty breathing, if you're losing your taste, new taste or smell loss, um, if you have a known exposure to somebody, if somebody you know has COVID-19, you've been exposed to them, or you uh, or suspect you may have been exposed, um, if you're getting screened for school or work, or um, maybe if you're going to a gathering and you want to know your status, want to make sure that you keep your friends, family, um, and those you care uh, about safe, um, make sure that you're not positive and you're not transmitting it to anybody that you might be seeing. Um, when you're asked to get tested by a healthcare provider and before and after you travel uh, to ensure that everybody's, uh, you know, making sure that they're keeping themselves and their community and their families safe. Um, so just wanted to encourage folks to continue to get tested uh, should any of those apply to you. Uh, we have testing available at, at Colbert Community Center um, and, and a number of uh, avenues. Um, so that's kind of my COVID update. Uh, back to you, Gil. Really appreciate it. All right, thank you, Stephanie, very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Now we'll move on to Dr. Lily Muldoon. She is the Medical Director of Public Health for CHCC. Dr. Muldoon. Thank you, Gil, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me join you today. I wanted to take a few minutes to um, add on to the comments by uh, CEO and our epidemiologist um, about how to be interpreting some of these numbers and what it means for you in your daily life. Um, so we'll kind of be talking about the COVID trends, and I want to give a point about vaccination, particularly about uh, the fourth booster, which is new information that has changed for us. I'll be uh, discussing what it's going to be like to be living with COVID, uh, specifically what being in high community level actually means to us. And then I'll be going over some of the different treatment options. So I think that the trends are very interesting here and the graphs that Stephanie showed highlight a few things for us. First is that we have been mimicking uh, pretty exactly what happened in the mainland in Guam with regards to how there were peaks with both the Delta and the Omicron surges. And we can see too that our rates of COVID here are precipitously dropping and that was expected as we got over the Omicron surge. As you can see though, we are not over it yet. I think that we can be optimistic about the uh, future, but we are still very much seeing a large number of cases. Our case positivity rate now is um, still nearly 30%, which is incredibly high. That means that the number of case, the tests that we're doing per um, day, um, close to 30% of them are coming back positive. Um, and that just is another recognition that our transmission rate continues to be high here. And so while I know we may be tired of having our restrictions in COVID, we may be tired of wearing our masks, I encourage us all to continue to do that because we need to keep ourselves and each other safe. But we do know that the end of this surge will be coming soon, and that's why we have the community levels to help give us signals of when we can um, take our masks off and take a break and also give us signals of when we need to put our masks back on and be a little bit more conservative and restrictive in our daily behaviors. Um, so I um, also wanna give an update on our opportunity for people to get their fourth shot. Uh, this has been approved by the CDC for people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised. This includes people who are on cancer treatment, are organ transplant recipients, 
are, are HIV or on, on immunosuppressive drugs like high dose corticosteroids. And it's those people that are considered to be moderately or severely immunocompromised and should work with their healthcare provider to get their fourth dose. They're going to be eligible for their fourth dose three months after their first dose, I'm assuming after their third dose. So their fourth dose can happen three months after the third dose, and it should be one of the mRNA vaccines. Um, that's either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. We request people who think that they fit that criteria to have a conversation with your healthcare provider. They can complete the form and uh, sign it, and then you can take it to the immunization center or our immunization clinic in order to get vaccinated. And just given um, the likelihood that we will continue to see more COVID cases, different variants are gonna be impacting our community this year. I encourage all of you who fit that category to make an immediate appointment with your healthcare provider so that we can get you boosted. Doing it sooner rather than later is very important. Um, and then the next thing I want to speak about is um, how to interpret and understand these community levels. This is something that was proposed by the CDC as the next phase of how we're gonna be addressing this pandemic. Um, and Stephanie gave the example of the different criteria that go into determining what our community level is. And we're community le level either high, medium, or low. And it's based off of first, the total number of cases, so the transmission rate. Um, and that's kind of an early warning sign for communities to know if they're starting to see high number of cases, it's likely that we'll start seeing both hospitalizations and thereby an increase in deaths. So the first um, criteria, they're looking at new cases. And then we're also looking at um, the number of hospitalizations for COVID and then the um, number of inpatient, or excuse me, the number of new hospitalizations and also the um, percent of inpatient beds that are occupied by COVID-19 patients. And those last two criteria really represent what COVID is um, and how it's straining our health system or not. And then we can use these recommendations in order to help clarify what we should be doing with our community and what type of restrictions we actually need. So just to go over what it means to be in high community level, that means that we should be wearing masks indoors when in the public. So we still continue to recommend that anybody inside in public should be wearing a mask, regardless of what your vaccination level is. Second, people need to be staying up on their vaccine um, schedule. Uh, it's important for you to have responsibility for yourself to be recognizing when it's either five months after your last shot and you're ready for your booster or whether you're in the category that we uh, give you the opportunity for your fourth booster. Please take some personal responsibility to reach out to your healthcare provider or go over to the immunization clinic to stay up on your vaccines. As Stephanie mentioned, the third thing is to make sure you're getting tested. If you are symptomatic, make sure you get tested and isolate yourself from people so that you are not spreading it around. Um, it's really important that the second that you start to have a sore throat, runny nose, headache, or fevers, that you mask up and try to stay away from people who are more vulnerable because we don't want to be spreading the virus to people that could be getting becoming very severely ill and hospitalized with this disease. And because we're in the high risk um, community level, we're also taking additional precautions to protect the most vulnerable. And this is a unique component of being in the high level that we, um, and if you are high risk, that you're staying inside, that you're trying not to get the disease. And if you live with people who are high risk, you're just taking those extra precautions um, and taking these, what they describe as layered prevention measures in order to be sure that we're not getting the most vulnerable sick. Um, and if you do test positive for COVID, um, the same recommendations hold true. So the, nothing has changed with regards to what we are telling you to do. And I'll just go over that again for all of us. If you test positive for COVID-19, either at, um, a, at home on a rapid antigen test or in one of our community sites, you should immediately isolate. And that is considered day zero. After that, you have five days of isolation at home. You really should not be going outside, trying not to interact with other people because that's the time that you're the most infectious. If you're living with other people who are not sick, 
then you need to also take precautions inside your house. That could be staying in your own room, masking up when you're inside, making sure surfaces and hands are clean are all really important if you are sick with COVID and are with, living with people who may not already be infected with the disease. After five days, you're okay to go out into the community, but one thing that I emphasize is that you still may be infectious. So you should continue to wear a well-fitting mask while you're outside in the community, but it allows you to go back to work. It allows you to continue to do the daily activities you need to do. But just be aware that just because you have a certificate from COVID task force saying that you have passed your five day isolation does not mean that you can now be free just to have family dinners and um, hang out with your coworkers. Remember that it's really 10 full days after your positive test that you should be continuing to be um, restricted in your um, movement and also making sure you're keeping your mask on. Um, the best mask to wear is an N95 mask, if possible, um, particularly if you are known to be infectious, wearing an N95 mask is incredibly important. And the other component that's important with the um, treatment or the testing and if you're a positive aspect is to get treated if you fit the criteria to get treated. And we have this um, test to treat center at MCATS. If you are symptomatic with COVID-19, you are eligible for testing there. Um, we're trying to run a pretty efficient system where you can go in, you get screened, you get tested, and there is a team there that will interview you. And if you fit one of the criteria for treatment, that you can actually get treatment on site that day. Um, and so people who are eligible for treatment include anyone who has comorbidities. And what that means is people with a history of hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, lung disease, if they're immunocompromised, um, or if they're pregnant, they are eligible for treatment, in which case um, it's actually, uh, there's a few different options for treatment. The provider at MCATS will go over with you those options. The primary option that we have is called Tetrovimab, and it's an in infusion. So you'll have an IV started, and it's a 30-minute infusion. We watch you there to make sure you don't have any side effects, which are usually pretty limited, and then you um, can go home. And the point of this is to ensure that people who are high risk, who have those underlying medical diseases, can be prevented from getting uh, more severe disease. So again, if you are high risk, if you have underlying disease, if you're over 65 and you have any symptoms of COVID, please go over to MCATS or the Cloverville Center and you can get tested and treated right there. Um, those are my prepared remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, Dr. Medun, thank you so much. Folks, we'll open it up for questions. Tomas? Just wanted to follow up on the news of the fourth COVID uh, dose that will be administered. Uh, what is the CMI's capacity to do that? How many can we do? And can you just clarify, is this the same amount of dosage as the third dose, uh, but given at a different time? So just two questions, one on capacity, second on some details about this, the fourth dose. In, re in regards to, oh, sorry. In re <laughs> By the way, Warren is here also, just that's why I'm wearing my mask on. <laughs> okay, so, um, so if you have any questions for Warren as well. In regards to ca capacity, um, we do have the FEMA contractors here as well, um, but we do have the um, still FEMA contractors also with our mass vaccination site and the outreach that we are conducting. Um, we are usually doing that on weekends. Um, we had gone two, two to three weeks, I believe, at Catman to cover those areas. And um, again, you know, we have the, the adequate inventory supply. So we have that uh, as, as we're monitoring this, we, we have enough to be able to do it. The, um, in regards to, um, I guess the timing, as Dr. Muldoon mentioned, you know, that is uh, that we have shared the, the eligibility for it, which is really in the CDC guidelines for uh, severely, I'm sorry, moderately and severely immunocompromised uh, uh, individuals that have, uh, are high risk and they are eligible for that. And um, let me try to get the, the actual timeline for it so that we can share that with you and we will get that from the uh, vaccination team. All right, and then Sorry, can you just clarify um, 
how this is different if it is from the third dose and then also uh, if, if, if this is only specific to one manufacturer? Um, I have the numbers pulled up here. Um, this is our current inventory of both the Pfizer and Moderna. And we have uh, hundreds of doses for um, both of those that are available. Um, so I think that anybody who decides to get vaccinated or get their booster, we really will have the ability to do that. And our vaccine team is on top of it that if we start to have any signal that we are um, running low because of demand, we're able to get vaccines here. So I don't think that that is a current limitation or worry of ours. And then to answer your second question, um, it is the same vaccine. Um, both of them are either the Moderna or the Pfizer mRNA vaccines. Um, it's the same one in the series that we've been giving previously. And is there a chance that you're going, just my last question, is there a chance that you're going to expand the eligibility? Uh, you know, a few people might say, uh, I might not fall under the immunocompromised, um, uh, you know, circumstances, but, you know, I want to be extra safe and get my fourth dose. Uh, so is that a possibility? And when do you see that happening? I see that as a definite possibility. We follow what the CDC guidelines instruct us. And um, I think similar to the way the booster was rolled out, that they first saved it for the highest risk individuals. And then quickly over time, um, other people were eligible. I foresee that similar with this fourth shot, more people will be eligible over the next coming weeks to months. All right, thank you. That's all my questions. All right, any other questions out there? Folks, if not, then that'll wrap up our media briefing for today.